by one of the most quoted Bay Street economist, David Rosenberg. He's the founder and president of Rosenberg Research, and he'll be sticking around with us through the half hour. David, it's always nice to have you with us. Thank Appreciate you, sir. Time. Great. Um, well, you, you'd been pretty cautious, I know, in late 2023 on what might happen to Canada's economy this year. What, what's your current assessment of what's happening? Well, really, uh, a lot more of the same. And when you're taking a look at 2023, uh, the big story is the wide divide between economic activity and what's happening on population growth. So, you know, you, you mentioned that uh, population growth of uh, 3%, uh, real GDP, year over year, 0.5. Uh, so do the math. You're talking about real per capita economic activity, uh, you know, negative 2.5. So uh, unbeknownst to most people, perhaps uh, the biggest bulls uh, on the stock market, uh, maybe the Bay in Canada, is that uh, the recession in Canada is probably already starting and I think is going to accelerate uh, through most of this year. That's the big story. And uh, we do have an interest rate decision later this month. It looks like most on Bay Street are, are not expecting any change uh, this month. But as we move through the year, there is a growing expectation we'll see rate cuts. But it would seem to me that you would be more in the camp of seeing rate cuts sooner versus later. Is that fair to say? Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's something called policy lags, and they work in both directions. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons why this recession is going to accelerate in Canada is because we're still feeding off all that dramatic restraint that the Bank Canada put into the system. Uh, and I think that to a large extent, uh, the Bank Canada is going to be compelled to take out, uh, we're not even talking about uh, providing stimulus. Uh, I mean, the Bank Canada could cut rates 150 basis points and that would just basically get us towards a neutral posture. Uh, the economy here is uh, fundamentally weak. It's probably, uh, you know, one of the weakest economies uh, in the in the G10. Uh, and so, you know, the focus is on inflation, which is a classic lagging indicator. Inflation is going to come down uh, as demand lags supply. Uh, I think the Bank Canada, and, and frankly, not just the Bank Canada, most Bay Street economists I find very disappointing. Everybody focuses on the here and now. They can't see past the tip of their nose. Uh, the outlook for the economy, I think, is uh, one of, um, uh, of, of, you know, recession. In recessions, inflation declines. I think that the central bank would be better off focusing interest rates on its outlook as opposed to what inflation is doing right now. We're going to get another print tomorrow. Headlines are going to be filled with what the CPI did. The CPI is reflecting things that happened over the course of the past 3, 6, 12 months. It's not a forward-looking indicator. That's my big problem, not just in Canada, but in the U.S. too, this prevailing focus on coincident and lagging indicators. And that's going to get us into trouble. And I think both central banks, the Bank and the Fed, are going to be scrambling to cut rates aggressively, not eminently because they're like, I mean, they're like deer, deer in the headlights because they, they, missed the, uh, they missed the inflation. They were all intransitory and they made a mistake. Uh, they corrected that mistake in terms of inflation. Now the mistake's going to be made in terms of economic activity. And I'm saying that not just in Canada, but in the U.S. too. Uh, sometimes we hear a narrative that if central banks, uh, and let's take ours just as an example, um, if they start to indicate that it is time to lower interest rates, um, that especially with our, our our housing market, and we talked about some of the dynamics that have pushed up home prices in this country, uh, that if there's all of a sudden a signal that rates are coming down, that that's going to feed into the housing story, and then there's sort of these inflationary effects from that. Well, what's your general take on that? To me, that's a, that's a knee-jerk reaction, really. Uh, the Bank Canada is as restrictive currently on its monetary policy as was the case back in the John Crow era uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. They would have to cut rates a heck of a lot uh, to, to kickstart house inflation in Canada again and housing activity. So right now, I mean, how does that factor in? We're going to, I mean, maybe there, was, is there going to be really speculative activity because the Bank Canada is only taking out the excessive monetary restraint. We're not even talking about, I mean, the first 150 basis points in Canada, and you can almost say 200 basis points in the U.S., is not even easing. It's not even stimulating. It's just taking interest rates back to a neutral level. Mm. So, no, I sort of push back and, and take a look. With the, what, the, what are the banks doing on both sides of the border? They're boosting their loan loss provisioning. They're pulling back. Look at the credit numbers in Canada. Like, how are you going to get a speculative move up in home prices when the banks are pulling back on mortgage availability? So I sort of like, maybe there'll be a, a knee-jerk reaction, I suppose, but will it be sustainable? No. I think that the housing story in Canada is, is, is in the process of rolling over, and that's going to continue 
notwithstanding what the bank's going to do in that first 150 basis points, that is not stimulus, okay? That is just eradicating the excessive restraint. Let me, let me go to sort of the, the other side of that, because there was a, a big bank conference recently, uh, and a lot of the CEOs here in Canada said they, they feel okay, it sounded like, about this mortgage renewal process we're going to be going through over the next couple of years. Uh, but what's your assessment, you know, for the sticker shock that some Canadians will get from dealing with these higher interest rates? How do you feel about what's going to actually happen in the housing market uh, going forward? It, it, especially, I guess, if the, if the recessionary concerns uh, grown to something like you know notable job losses. Like, right. What does that mean for for that market? Well, look, we're going to be we're going to really be stress testing that thesis, okay? Because it's one thing, for example, to be withstanding uh, this uh, gigantic wave of mortgage rollovers uh, when you're creating jobs and when the unemployment rate is flat or going down. That's not the case anymore. We're going to be stress testing these mortgage rollovers in the context of rising unemployment. That, to me, the defining, the defining moment for the economy last year in Canada was this, okay? Uh, the labor force expanded by roughly 100,000. What was the employment increase? Barely more than 40,000. There was a huge gap between the labor force expansion and the jobs that were actually being created. What does that mean in layman terms? The unemployment rate's going up. And in fact, the unemployment rate in the past year has gone up almost a full percentage point. You look historically, uh, by the time you're up about a percentage point year over year in the unemployment rate, guess what? The recession's already started. Uh, each of the past eight recessions, only one head fake in the mid-1970s. So, yeah, so what's going to happen with the lag? Because this is how economics works. Rising unemployment is going to cut into wage growth. The Bank of Canada stays on the sidelines, doesn't cut interest rates, but the servicing burden in terms of the interest payments out of income is going to become impaired just by the fact that a looser labor market is going to cut into wage growth. Hmm. Okay, so that's really going to be the story this year. And especially the Bank Canada, during the headlights, staying on hold as wage growth slows, unemployment goes up. And then they'll be scrambling to cut interest rates second half of the year. The longer they wait, the harder those rates are going to fall, John. So we'll watch those trends. And then on the immigration front, which becomes a very political issue, um, you're looking at the numbers. And I think there's sort of a question on Bay Street about what level of immigration can Canada's uh, economy withstand, essentially, without these other dynamics? Like, if there's not enough new housing being built, is this a challenge for the economy going forward? H how do you view this, uh, this, this, this storyline? Well, uh, a smart immigration policy, uh, which we have not had in a long time, is an immigration policy, and I'm talking about excluding the social policy aspects. Got to make sure that the immigration coming in at least pays for itself. Uh, like basically the people coming in, what jobs are they getting? Uh, so you're going to tell me that they're going to be employed in value-added manufacturing that's going to improve productivity, bring it on. If we're talking about bringing in construction workers, uh, tradespeople, that could actually boost Canada's housing stock, I say bring it on. The problem, as I said before, there's nothing wrong with immigration. It's just not paying for itself. We have virtually flat GDP growth, 3% immigration. So the question is for the government, these people that are coming into the country, and we're not talking about refugees or the social aspect of it, okay? From a pure economic standpoint, the people that are coming in, what are they doing once they're here? Okay, because this is an unprecedented divide between what the economy is doing, and what's happening on the population side. And the way that you actually measure a country's economic well-being is through real GDP or real gross domestic income per capita. And in Canada, it is decaying at an alarming rate. 